Hello and welcome to Prof. Dale's property video number 11. The topic of this video is executory interests. There are two kinds of them, shifting and springing, and we're going to learn the difference between them in this video. Before we do, we need to ask what an executory interest is. We've covered this in a previous video, so this is just a little review. An executory interest, first of all, has to be created in a third party, that is, not the grantor and not the immediate grantee. This is a future interest that's in someone other than the grantor. Second, in order to be an executory interest, it must not satisfy at least one of the rules for remainders. You'll recall that there are four rules for remainders, and an executory interest breaks at least one of these rules, and therefore can't be a remainder. What are the rules? Well, it's got to be created at the same time and by the same instrument as the prior estate. Usually, executory interests, by the way, do meet that rule. Second, it's got to follow a life estate. A remainder does. Third, there mustn't be a built-in time gap between the end of the present estate and the beginning of possession under the future estate. And finally, a remainder is not allowed to cut short the prior estate, usually a life estate. So if we have a remainder, it's got to satisfy all of these rules. And if it breaks even one of them and it's created in someone other than the grantor, it can't be a remainder and therefore must be an executory interest. Now let's take a look at this example. To A, but if A dies, not survived by any children, then to B. I want you to notice, first of all, that A does not have a life estate. It doesn't say to A for life. And we don't read in the words for life if the grantor didn't say them. We don't imagine that they're there. So what is A's interest if it's not a life estate? Well, the answer is it's a defeasible fee estate. And that's actually a pretty reasonable answer because it's possible that A's interest will last forever. If A does have children surviving him, then A's interest becomes a fee simple absolute, in fact, and it will last indefinitely into the future. So as it's originally given, it's a fee simple, but it is defeasible on the condition that A dies without having any children surviving him. In that event, it passes to B. So B's interest, because it's following a defeasible fee rather than a life estate, can't be a remainder. What is it? Well, it's an executory interest instead, of course. But this executory interest is of a particular kind. We call it a shifting executory interest because possession will shift from A to B in the future if the condition on the executory interest is satisfied. That is, A dies not survived by any children. So when we have a case where property shifts from one person to another and the second person has an executory interest, we call that a shifting executory interest. Now there's another kind of executory interest as well. It's called a springing executory interest. And here's a good example of it. O grants property to A to take possession when A passes the bar exam. Or we might say if and when A passes the bar because at this point A hasn't passed the bar and we don't know for sure whether A will do so or not. Well, A obviously has a future interest here and it's a future interest in someone other than the grantor. So it must be either a remainder or an executory interest. What's the prior estate and who has it? Well, the answer is the original grantor, O, still has the prior estate. In this strange example, O didn't give a prior present interest to anybody else. He only gave a future interest to A. So is the prior interest a life estate? Obviously not. It's a fee simple estate. Now, it's a fee simple that has become by virtue of this conveyance, a defeasible fee simple because it's possible that the fee simple will be cut off if and when A passes the bar exam. So what O has is a fee simple defeasible, and that means that what the interest of A is, it must be not a remainder because a re remainder never follows a fee simple. 
it's a mu it must be an executory interest. So we the bottom line is that O has a fee simple subject to executory interest, and A has an executory interest. Now, you'll notice that possession goes directly from O, the grantor, to A when the condition is satisfied. It doesn't go to anybody else first, and so we say it springs out of the grantor and directly to the, the holder of the executory interest. And therefore, we call this a springing executory interest. Now, this kind of springing executory interest can take many forms. It's easy to think of other examples of it. To A, when A reaches age 21. To A, if and when A gets married. To A, if and when A passes the bar exam. Really, to A, if and when almost any possible future event. All of those are good examples of springing executory interest. Now here's a graphic representation of the two kinds of executory interests. For the shifting kind, there are always two grantees. One gets a present interest and the other gets a future interest. And possession goes from the first grantee to the second at a future time. So O gives a present interest to A. If some condition happens in the future, possession will shift from A to B and that's the shifting executory interest. Now, on the, the other hand, with the springing executory interest, there's only one grantee, and possession goes directly from the grantor to that grantee at a future time. So O gives a future interest to B, and if some condition happens in the future, then B gets possession of the property. Are there any legal consequences to classifying an executory interest as springing or shifting? No, there really are no consequences at all that turn on that distinction. It's just a helpful way of describing the two kinds of executory interests. We might also ask, is there any legal consequence to classifying an executory interest as vested or contingent? And the answer is no. In fact, we don't bother classifying executory interests as vested or contingent. For purposes of the rule against perpetuities, which we're going to cover in the next video, executory interests are all considered contingent as long as they're still future. Until they become possessory, they're treated as all being contingent. But we don't bother slapping that label of vested or contingent on an executory interest as we do a remainder. That completes video 11 on executory interests. The next video, video 12, will tackle the much more challenging topic, the rule against perpetuities. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. And thanks for watching.